Gentlemen, what is going on today? My name is Ryan Mickler. I'm your host and the founder of this, the Order Man podcast and movement. Welcome here today and welcome back. Today, we're going to talk about starting a business. We're going to talk about why that is, why it's important. I've got four or five key steps or reasons as to why you should start a business. And then we're going to talk about three or four things that you can do to consider what business you should start, how you should get started, how you should start making money and, uh, and the like. So, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Before I do, just want to mention, um, a lot of you guys have asked about the Iron Council. That's our exclusive brotherhood. Uh, we're having conversations about business, about money, about fitness. In fact, this month, we're talking all about masculine health. Next month for the month of May, we're going to be talking about doing powerful networking, which is a concept of business we might get into a little bit today. Uh, we are closed right now, but if you want to be put on the list, the notification list, then head to orderaman.com slash Iron Council orderman.com slash iron council. We open back up in, let me think here, May. Yes, the end of May, first part of June is when we're opening back up. So a couple of months away, get on the list. And also in the meantime, check out our battle ready program at orderman.com slash battle ready. All right, guys, let's talk about this. Um, this one was spurred on by a conversation that I had with my accountant and we were looking at ways that I could reduce my tax liability for 2022, it was significant, unfortunately, unfortunately, in that I have to pay the government who misuses and mishandles and mismanages everybody's money every single minute of every single day. Uh, but fortunate in that financially, we did pretty well last year. But I'm constantly looking at ways, legal ways, of course, to reduce my tax liability. And this spurred a conversation about starting a business. And that's one of the reasons that every man should consider starting a business. You, you may not think that it's going to take over the world or it's going to be the next Facebook or Twitter or SpaceX or Tesla or any number of companies that maybe you like and value. Uh, but there's reasons above and beyond global domination when it comes to starting a business. And this goes for, I think, just about every man out there uh, number one, it's going to help you hedge against your, uh, your income now, the job, the career that you have right now. Uh, so many guys think that just because they're in a job and an occupation that they've been in it for 20, 30, 40 years, that that's stable. Guys, I'm telling you what, that could go away at any minute. And what we're going to see in the current economy and as we move forward, especially as we get into presidential elections over the next several years, depending on the direction that that goes, and it's not going in a positive direction right now, you're going to see a continually, a continually weakening uh, U.S. dollar. You're going to continue to see inflation. You're going to continue to see massive amounts of volatility in the market. Uh, you're going to see companies that make dumb decisions, just absolutely moronic decisions. One in particular is Bud Light by bringing on Dylan Mulvaney is one of their spokespersons, and you can see the amount of uh, money that they've lost as a result. Uh, another one, Fox News, just let go of Tucker Carlson. They've lost billions of dollars in market share because of that decision. Now, look, I'm not here to tell you what's good and bad and what's right or wrong. These are organizations that are going to make their own decisions, but I'm telling you what, we're going to see more and more companies that are gonna get into this woke ideology and they're gonna promote this and they're gonna be negatively impacted. And you might be one of the people that is a casualty of that. You know, I think about with Bud Light, for example, those distributors, they didn't do anything wrong. They're all doing their job, they're distributing, they're driving, they're, they're, they're bringing Bud Light to different stores and restaurants and bars. And it wasn't their decision to make a dumb political business decision. And yet they're suffering the consequences of it. And you are susceptible to that. If you're working for somebody else, whether it's an organization like Bud Light or a mom and pop shop down the road or a restaurant up the street, you're susceptible to political changes. You're susceptible to personal changes in the owner's circumstances and situation. And unless you have multiple income streams, whether that's through uh, investing in the stock market, investing in real estate, or in this particular case, having another source of income that's going to provide should something not work out for you, that's a pretty powerful reason to consider starting a business. So number one, you're hedging. Number two, you're just gonna make more money, especially obviously if it's a profitable business. What would it be like to have an extra $500 a month or $5,000 a month or $10,000? What would it be like to have six figures a year coming in from a side business? That's very feasible. 
It's very possible. How do I know? Because that's what we're doing here. This was a side business long before it was my permanent and full-time occupation. But what would change about your life if you could pay off your debt? What could change about your life if you could afford a family vacation? What would change about your life if you weren't stressed out about money at any given point trying to pay the bills? And how is that spilling over into your family life, your personal life, and the relationship you have with your kids and your wife and friends? It's significant. But if you had an extra little bit of money coming in that was hedging against what else might happen over here, you're going to be in a much more powerful position. We talk about this all the time. It's all about sovereignty, which is basically if we strip everything else away, doing what you want, when you want, why you want, how you want, and you can do that if you're financially free. And you better be financially free, especially in the wake of what's going to happen in the future with regards to the economy. It's going to be devastating for millions and millions of millions of Americans. And I don't want that to be you because you have people to take care of yourself and the people you love. Uh, number two, and this kind of goes along, well, I guess number two is the money situation. Number three is the tax benefits of doing it. All right, if you, and look, I'm not an accountant. I'm not a financial advisor. I was a financial advisor in another life before order of man. In fact, I sold my financial planning practice so I could go full-time into this. So take this advice with a grain of salt and consult your legal and professional and financial team and ask them if this is good for you. But when it comes to taxes, you got to have write-offs. Like you, you cannot claim 100% of your income because if you do, you're going to get absolutely molested by the IRS and the federal government and the state government as well. They want their grubby, greedy hands on your hard-earned money. And I'm not entirely against the concept of taxes. I think if we're going to be part of communities, we're going to have services that we all collectively use, or that are good for society generally, then that has to be funded. I'm, I'm not anti-tax, but I am anti-excessive tax, and I am anti-misuse, and I am anti-theft. I'm anti all of the. I'm anti non-representation. Like how how is it that we have so many taxes everywhere you turn? There's a tax for this. There's a tax for that. There's a licensing fee for this. There's a new license you need to get. Oh, you want to drive a car, you got to get a license and you got to pay taxes for that. Then you got to pay taxes for the car that you bought and taxes for the tires that are on that car. It's absolutely ridiculous. And then when you die, your kids pay taxes. When you make a dollar, you're taxed. When you pay an employee, they're taxed. It's nonsense. It's evil. And it's all designed to keep you broke and in poverty, dependent on big daddy government. I don't want that to be us. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for every possible opportunity and loophole and legal law and decision that's available to get out of giving my hard-earned money to the government. And how do you do that? By having write-offs. So if you go on a vacation and it happens to be that you do some business there, that becomes a write-off. Again, consult your accountants on this. If there's certain areas of the house that you use for your business, you can write that off or depreciate that element of your house as a business expense. Same thing with your cell phone. Now, all of a sudden, your 100 or 150 or $200 cell phone, you get to claim that less money on your income, your internet. All of these things that you actually use on a daily basis, if you're using them for legitimate business purposes, and it does have to be a legitimate business, which if I understand correctly, doesn't even mean that you need to make money. It means that you need to be in the business of making money, that you need to try to make money. But we all know businesses lose revenue year in and year out. So it has to be a legitimate business, even if it doesn't have any legitimate business income as of yet. Again, consult your CPAs on the specifics of that. But I want to look for every opportunity I can to write things off. When I buy a new piece of art, if it's going in my office, then that's a business deduction. If there's a course available that I want to buy on some element of, of my business or skill set development, then I get to write that off. If I go on a trip and I bring my podcast equipment with me and I do podcasts, that's a, that's a, a write-off. If I go on a family vacation, if I'm incorporated the correct way, I can actually write that off as our shareholder meeting for the year. This is all legal ways to do this. Everybody complains about, oh, you know, the, the wealthy, they don't pay, pay their fair share. No, they don't. They actually pay more than their fair share if we're being honest about it. But people complain, oh, they're using these loopholes. They're, yeah, right. They're using the legal code 
to their advantage to not give big daddy government as much money as they absolutely have to, or as much as the government would want them to. Well, guess what? It's a law. There's no law that says, hey, only these people can do that. Now, there are a few when it comes to financial regulations. I won't get into that. But far and wide, what's applicable to high income earners, high net worth people is applicable to the rest of us. The only difference is we need to figure out how to exploit it. Now, I'm not telling you to do anything unethical or illegal or immoral. I'm telling you to pay your fair share of taxes, but not a penny more. Not a penny more. And if you have a business, a legitimate business, you give yourself an opportunity to write things off. Uh, number three, or I guess number four, I added another one in there. So number four is fulfillment. It's fulfilling, you know, to, to start a business from nothing, to grow it into something that wasn't there previously, to pursue a passion and an interest and a hobby that's engaging to, into you, that's interesting to you, that meets a, a need in the community. It's fulfilling. It's rewarding. And I've seen <clears throat> studies and, and, and data and research that shows that upwards of 70% of the workforce is dissatisfied in some way with their current occupation. Imagine that, 70%, it's probably even higher. Seven out of 10 people, 70 out of 100 people are miserable. They go into a job they hate, they don't like the work they do, they don't like the people they're working with, they don't like what they're offering, and even if they do like what they're offering, it, it changes from, from time to time. They're, they're handcuffed by what they can uh, do with their clients and how they can serve them. That was part of my problem with financial services. I knew we were helping people. I knew we were doing good. I knew it was helping families retire and build wealth and have financial prosperity. And yet the companies I worked with wouldn't let me do podcasting without seeing what the script was. They wouldn't let me put out certain quote unquote marketing material without putting their stamp of approval on it. I don't want to live like that. I want to be fulfilled by offering things that I think are valuable. And then the market can decide, not some bureaucrat who doesn't have any really day-to-day -day expertise or experience in the business I'm trying to do. I want it within my hands. And each day when I go to sleep at night, I know that I did a podcast that served somebody. I get a dozen messages a day. Ryan, I appreciate this because of here's how I changed my life. Here's how I worked on the relationship with my wife. Or here's how I reconnected with my estranged children. Uh, here's how I started the business. Here's how I got a raise. That's fulfilling. That's rewarding. That's makes that's fuel for me. That makes me happy. That makes me satisfied. And I am satisfied in my work. I'm one of the three of the 10 who actually likes the work they do, but I had to go out and create it. And I think you can too. <clears throat> if you're not satisfied with where you are, first, I would say, learn to be satisfied with where you are by improving the environment around you. But second, create a new environment, create new opportunities, which leads me into point number five. And that is one of the reasons that it's really important that you start a business is for skill development. It's such a powerful, potent way to articulate, identify, and hone and refine a skill set that will help you sell something or make yourself more marketable. So for example, <clears throat> as we started this podcast, I had to learn to become a great communicator. And I did that through taking courses, through studying other great communicators that I wanted to be like, and then practice. Somebody told me the other day, we've got 1,050 podcasts that we've done now. Over 1,000 podcasts. And people will say, oh, Ryan, you're great at podcasting. Yeah, right, because I've done 1,000 episodes and I've had to exploit my, my, my strengths. I've had to shore up weaknesses. I've had to identify what I'm good at. I've had to identify what I'm not good at. I've had to take courses. I've had to go to events. I've had to learn to market. I've had to learn to do social media. One failure I had early on was when we did our very first event. <clears throat> I think I said fairy first event, not fairy first event. Uh, that sounds like some woke event that you would see in like Portland or something. No, very first event. Uh, we were, we, we were going to do the event. And about three weeks before we were going to do it, I didn't have a single person sign up. Not a single person. So I had a choice to make. Do I throw in the towel? Do I nix the event? Do I not do it? Do I accept defeat? No, of course not. I go back to the drawing board and I figure out what I could do better, what I didn't do well, and how I can improve in order to market this event a little better. About three months after that one, we ran our second iteration of the event, and we were able to get 20 guys to sign up for the event, and we called ourselves the Terrible 20. In fact, we still do. 
but I had to learn a new skill set. And that in in that failure, it forced me to learn something new, a lot of new things. And I've had a lot of failures. I've I've had situations with our merchandise component of the of the business where I've literally lost tens of thousands of dollars. Just vanish. I might as well just go burn it. At least if I burn it, it'd give me some heat for the night. Thousands of dollars, just gone. And you know what that does? First, you know, a little tear might come out of the corner of your eye because that's valuable. <laughs> but it forces you to evaluate your inadequacies. If there's no consequence for your shortcoming, there's no reason to fix it. But if you're going to lose thousands of dollars because you don't know how to communicate effectively, or you don't know how to work a supplier chain or vet the companies that you're working with, you're going to learn pretty quick when you start feeling it in your pocketbook. So if you're out there starting a business, you're going to start learning new things that you need to implement in your life to improve your business, which will in turn improve your fulfillment and help other people and all the other things I talked about. I'm sure there's a, a, an endless list of reasons why it would behoove you Here's my word of the day, behoove you to start a business. But I think those are some pretty compelling reasons right there. Number one, you're hedging against the risk associated with your current career. Number two, you supplement your income and start generating more revenue that could pay off debt or go into other investments. Number three, you reduce your tax liability so big daddy government doesn't get their grubby hands on all of your hard-earned money just a little bit. Uh, number four, your ability to be fulfilled because you're pursuing something interesting and meaningful and life-changing to other people. And then number five is you're going to be forced to develop new skills. I call it skill acquisition. You're going to have to acquire new skills to be successful. And if you don't, you'll fail and nobody wants to fail. So you will develop new skills. Now let's talk about from a high level view, what you can do. Cause I know a lot of you are probably listening to this. You're like, Ryan, that all sounds great. I already know all this stuff. You're preaching to the choir here. I don't need you to tell me that I need it for tax benefits or I'll feel happier by starting a business. I know all that. How do I do it? Guys, I think we tend to overthink things. We tend to complicate things that don't need to be complicated and we make it harder than it needs to be, probably because it helps inflate our ego a little bit. Like, oh, this is sophisticated. This is hard work. I have to really be smart. And so you make it harder than it needs to be because you want to feel important, like you overcame something tremendous. And I'm telling you, you're not, okay? Like, I'm not trying to be mean-spirited when I say that. Like, let's not make it as big a deal as it is. It's not really that big a deal. What I would suggest to you, first and foremost, is that you begin to take out a journal. I've got journals everywhere. I've got notepads here. I've got a battle planner right here. I've got my daily journal right here. I've got journals and papers and pens everywhere because I write this stuff down. But what I'd like you to do is if you're in this mode of starting a business and you don't know where to start, I want you to start documenting things that you enjoy. That's it. Things that you enjoy. I'm working on a project with my daughter right now. We're rebuilding a bike. I bought a bike at a yard sale for $10 and bought a tube for five and it was running just fine. And I thought, you know, this would be cool if we did this together. We worked on this together. So we pulled the whole bike apart. I've never done that before, stripping the paint off as we speak. We got some spray paint that she wanted and it's, we're going to do the whole bike. We're going to do it right. It's going to look beautiful. I'll show you guys when I'm done. Well, you know what? I might find a lot of joy and satisfaction in that, uh, in that process. I got a little fuzz here and this is bothering me. I might just have to let it bother me. Uh, I might find a lot of joy and satisfaction in it. So much so that I might want to do it again. So much so that maybe one of her friends sees the bike and her parents are like, hey, like my daughter wants a custom bike. Well, can you do one for us? If that's something I enjoy. All of a sudden I'm in business. If it's taking pictures, if it's helping coach baseball teams, I'm coaching my two, son, two of my son's baseball teams right now. I like coaching. It's, it's, it's nothing that I'm, I'm so good at that uh, I have a lot of valuable information to share, but there's one guy, his name is Ryan. Uh, we played against his team yesterday. He's an, he's, he's an amazing coach, communicates with the kids so well, motivates them, is hard and firm with them, knows a lot about the sport, way more than I know about the sport of baseball. He's tremendous. He's, he's incredible. Well, look, how many parents want to have their kids coached on hitting or the proper mechanics of throwing a baseball or any number of, of dimensions to the game of baseball? That could be an opportunity for him to do a little coaching on the side and earn a little additional revenue, do something that he really loves 
something he's really engaged in and something that will be fulfilling for him and other people. So guys, look to your strengths. Look to the things that you enjoy. Now, certain things you may not want to turn into a business. I can certainly understand that. You just like it as a hobby and that's fine. But if it is something that people will pay for or are paying for somewhere else, then you know it's likely they may pay for from you if you offer a good, good service or a good product. So another couple of things to look for when you're wondering, because here, here, this is a very interesting, it's an interesting dynamic for those people who are good at things. And, and I'm not in that camp. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if there's one thing where I'm like, I'm really good at that. I was naturally born to do that thing. Like I'm so gifted at this. That isn't the case for me. It's probably not the case for a lot of you guys too. You probably feel me on that. But for the things that you are good at, and I, th I think everybody is good at something. For the things that you are good at, it's, it's hard to know that you're good at it. It really is because you're so proficient at it that you think, isn't just everybody like this? No, you're not. Let's say you really enjoy photography and you've got an eye for it. You've got a knack for it. You look at the pictures, they're beautiful. People see your pictures like, oh my goodness, what a, an amazing picture. What'd you take it with? You're like, my iPhone. They're like, how? Because like, they don't see it the same way as you. For whatever reason, you see it different. Experiences, culture, upbringing, belief, background, IQ, intelligence, all this stuff goes into play. You see it differently. And you have to know that that makes you special. That makes you unique. If you believe that you're unique and believe that you're special, then you know that your ability, in this case, to take pictures is not something everybody possesses. Like you've all seen pictures, like you could put 10 guys in a line. I've got this big, beautiful desert mountain right here in front of me. I could put 10 guys in my backyard and say, hey, I want you guys to take about 15 minutes, get the angle you want, get the perspective, get the lighting. You got 15 minutes, take a picture. And there's always going to be one that's really good. And there's always going to be one that's horrible. That's just how it works. So if you're the person who's good at the thing, then you can help the person who's not good at the thing. You have a certain set of skills, as Liam Neeson would say, a certain set of skills that other people don't possess. How do you know? Here's how. If they're asking for your advice, they see something in you that you may not see in yourself. So if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, but uh, Bill, man, I've seen these pictures that you take and they're beautiful. And my daughter's got a wedding coming up. And like, do you have any tips or do you know any photographers? Light bulb moment should go off for you. Or hey, we've got an event coming up and you take great pictures. I don't know if you do photography, but... Would you come out and take pictures at this event? Light bulb moment. Or if they're asking for advice, let's say uh, Joe is going to build a bike with his daughter because he sees us building a bike. And he comes to me, he's like, hey, Ryan, you know, I, I want to build this bike. You, you built this before. And I don't know, I, I sprayed it with some spray paint, but it just it didn't turn out great. And I saw what you did and it looks so beautiful and shiny and almost perfect. Like, well, how did you do that? Light bulb moment. If people are asking for advice, then you have something they don't have. You have something they want and you can market it. Another great way is what are you doing when time goes the fastest? If time's just dragging on, it's boring, it's miserable, it's horrible, then you're really not engaged in that thing. But if time's flying, it's either because you're really enjoying what you're doing or you're in this, what I would call, or what other people have called your zone of genius. Like you're operating in this zone, flow state, we've heard that term as well. You're operating in this state or this zone in which you're hyper-focused on that thing and you're so present and keenly in tune with what's going on that everything around you, including time, just seems to pass without you really noticing. Another one, what would you be doing if money weren't a concern? Let's say all your bills were paid for, all your income was taken care of, the food is, is covered, the housing is covered, money's not an issue for you. What would you be doing with your time? And I promise you, for the large bulk of us, we would not be sitting on the beach drinking Mai Tais. We might do that for a couple of days and then we'd all get bored. So what would you be doing after that? How would you occupy, occupy your time? You see a lot of old guys, they retire. What do they do? They go and get a job at the, uh, the golf course, maintaining lawns or, or putting water at, at, at the holes periodically. You know, maybe that's what they do. Uh, or they work at Walmart. Some people have to, others choose to because they want the social interaction with it. What would you be doing if money was not a concern? These are all indicators that you've stumbled onto something 
that you like, that's fulfilling, that's rewarding, that you enjoy, and could be a marketable product or service. Uh, number two, start talking with people about what they do to grow their businesses, especially if it's similar to yours. If you want to grow a woodworking business, for example, there's other people who are doing that in the community who are woodworkers. Go network with them. Go ask them questions. Get on the phone. Don't make it weird. Don't make it hard. People do. Oh, I don't know. I don't know what to say. I don't know. You're in your head. Stop that. Just go be curious. Hey, John, I know you do woodworking and man, I've seen your furniture around town. You sell some at the, the local hardware store and I've seen some other people that have uh, you know one of your rocking chairs and I'm thinking about starting a woodworking business. Can I take you to breakfast tomorrow morning? I just have a few questions about how you got started and how you figured out pricing and what tools you have. He's going to do it. The only reason he wouldn't do that is because we make it all weird and awkward and uncomfortable or we don't even approach it because we're too scared. Guys, open your mouths and go talk with people who are doing what you want to do and learn from them, grow from them, buy their courses, pay for their programs, go meet them in person. When I started Order of Man eight years ago, one of the very first things I did is I went to an event that was for men and I introduced myself even before the event to all the uh, speakers at the event. I sent them an email. Hey, I'm going to be out there. I'm excited to listen to your presentation. I like what you have to say and I'm anxious to meet you. My name is Ryan. I'm going to come up and shake your hand and remind you of this email. That's it. And then when I go, guess what? I'm one of, if not the only person who did that. And who are they going to remember? Me, of course, me. Get yourself around other performers. Get yourself around other people who are doing what you want to do. People will say all the time, I don't know how to do that. Yes, you do. The people you want to be around, they have products, they have courses, they have podcasts, they have emails, they have programs available, they have memberships. They have stores. They have, they have things. Go there and start to surround yourself with those people. And then the tip with that is just to be curious. Just keep the curiosity. You don't need 20 questions before you go there. Uh, you, know, you don't need to have some scripted out conversation. You don't need to be in your head about it. You just need to go and be curious. Hey, Ryan, how'd you start a podcast? Why did you start that podcast? What were some of the mistakes you made? Oh, how'd you overcome that? How did you go overcome rejection or, or getting over the way people thought of you? Like, just be curious. We all have questions. Very few of us ask them. So ask them. Um, the next thing, this is really important and one a lot of people overlook. You have to sell something. Businesses make money. Now, I know that goes a little bit against what I said when it comes to taxes, but you have to actually go out there and sell something. I would not suggest you give away a product for free. People do that. Well, I'm beta testing and I'm... Okay, then you're a charity. You're not a business. You can do a deep discount. You know, you, 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 can, you can slash the price on a little bit, but you, ha you actually have to sell something. And you don't need to sell the, the, the best. You don't need to sell the final rendition of it. You don't need to sell it when, you know, in 20 years when your art form is perfected. You can base your price on where you're at in your experience, but you have to sell something. You have to. When we started Order of Man, it was like, how are we going to make money? At first, we we're going to do ads, but nobody was listening. So ads didn't want to put their ads on our podcast and pay for it, rightfully so. So I started a course. We called it the Iron Council. It's a 12-week course for 12 guys. We sold it for 100 bucks. I could probably sell that course now for 1000 or even more. But I sold it for 100 because I didn't really know where to start. But I didn't give it away. So here it is. Here's what I'm offering. Do you want it? And enough people said, yeah. And I realized, okay. We're on to something here. When nobody signed up for the event, I could have said to myself, well, nobody likes what I have to say. Nobody wants to do events. That wasn't the case. I just needed to come back to the drawing board and remarket it a little bit differently. But ultimately, you got to get people to get their checkbook out and pay you. Otherwise, you're more of a charity and probably not even a good one at that than you are a business. So what can you sell? And what can you sell as quickly as possible? That's usually what I'll recommend for people. As quickly as you possibly can. I don't want you to wait for a year. A different product in a year, sure. A different product in 10 years, absolutely. What product can you sell today? And who can you sell it to and how can you market it? And then the last thing I would say here, guys, when it comes to starting a business is that you just implement the feedback. And, and I already alluded to that with the event. The feedback that we received was that they weren't interested. Okay, let's sit down, let's take a breath, 
figure out why people are interested in, in it, and let's try something different. And we did, and it worked. Other things have worked well immediately. Other things have taken time. Other things have developed over years and years of trial and error. But we're always looking for feedback from our client base on what works. And sometimes that feedback is that it's just crickets. And that's good feedback for you. People aren't interested. Either they're not seeing or they're not interested. Get to the root of what it is, figure it out, and address it. Other times people try it and don't like it. Okay, well, why? Why don't you like it? Oh, it was too expensive for what it was. Okay, well, maybe you need to reevaluate your, evaluate your pricing or maybe you need to elevate your quality, but constantly be implementing the feedback that you get so that you can now sell this for more. You can identify new products and services that you want to make available to people. Look for ancillary products, you know? So for example, if you make uh, wooden benches for people, maybe you consider making small wooden tables for people or wooden book stands. They're ancillary products. If you can make a table, you can make a book stand. Do it if that's what the market demands. All right, guys, so there you go. I hope I convinced you. I know I didn't get into the weeds of all the, you know, the nitty-gritty details of what you need to do to be a success, but I think ultimately the greatest obstacle you're going to have is just getting started. Y'all know you should do it, but how many of you are going to start? I really want to see more businesses. So reach out to me, connect with me. If you have questions about how to start a business or what I've done here, I'm an open book. I'm happy to share any of that. I've, I've, I was going to say I've never been scarce. I have been scarce in my life with my information. I'm not anymore because I realized that there's only really a couple of types of people in the world. There's the people who need your advice and there's the people who won't take your advice. And so the people, if you could share all of your secrets, you could get, if I could get Elon Musk in here and I could say, hey, share with us all of your secrets about how you had your such, such tremendous business success. You're going to have a, a large group of people who aren't going to do anything with that information, even if you divulge all the secrets. And for the other type of people, the second type of people, even if you do divul diverge or divulge, excuse me, all of your secrets or you don't, they were going to figure it out anyways, because that's the type of people they are. So you might as well build up goodwill with them, right? If somebody calls me and they're like, hey, I'm going to start a men's movement. I'm like, well, F you, like, I'm not going to help you with that. I, why would, I don't understand why I wouldn't. Either I share everything and they don't implement it, which doesn't hurt me any except for my time, or they do implement it and they were going to do it whether I shared or not. And then if I wasn't good to them, now I just create somebody who I have contention and animosity with. Don't I want partners? Don't I want to network with people? Of course. Of course I do. So guys, I want to see you do more of this. I gave you some reasons. Hedging your bet, making more money, reducing taxation, building fulfillment, acquiring new skills. And I gave you that, that uh, small little framework, finding something you really enjoy, talking with people about it in your market, selling something, anything, and then implementing feedback as you receive it. I hope that helps. Let me know. And if there's other conversations you want me to have and talk with you about, please let me know as well. You can do that at, well, on Instagram. It's probably, yeah, it's probably best. On Instagram, at Ryan Nickler. In the meantime, check out the wait list for the Iron Council, orderaman.com slash Iron Council, and our free battle ready program which might actually help you flesh out some ideas for your business at orderaman.com slash battle ready. All right, guys, we'll be back next week. Until then, go out there, take action, and let's all of us, myself included, all become the men we are meant to be.